Al and Tipper Gore are here. For much of their 32-year marriage, they have lived in the political spotlight. Al Gore represented Tennessee in the House of Representatives and the United States Senate before becoming vice president in the administration of Bill Clinton from 1992 to 2000. He was widely viewed as a strong political partner of President Clinton in those eight years. His marriage to Tipper has always been viewed with admiration by all who knew them and was reflected in one of the most publicized kisses of all times before Al accepted the Democratic nomination in Los Angeles. In 2000, the Gores retreated from public life after winning the popular vote but losing to President George W. Bush. Here is what he said in concession. Good evening. Just moments ago, I spoke with George W. Bush and congratulated him on becoming the 43rd President of the United States. And I promised him that I wouldn't call him back this time. Let there be no doubt, while I strongly disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. I accept the finality of this outcome, which will be ratified next Monday in the Electoral College. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. Tipper and I feel a deep gratitude to Joe and Hadassah Lieberman, who brought passion and high purpose to our partnership and opened new doors, not just for our campaign, but for our country. And I call on all Americans. I particularly urge all who stood with us to unite behind our next president. This is America. Just as we fight hard when the stakes are high, we close ranks and come together when the contest is done. And while there will be time enough to debate our continuing differences, now is the time to recognize that that which unites us is greater than that which divides us. To add some levity to this, uh, you were on David Letterman the night after and no, said, no, I wasn't assume, on. I was watching the show. Oh, yeah. and, he said, and he he said, well, Al Gore gave the speech of his life last night. Nice timing, Al. <laughs> <laughs> I should say the Gores have recently written two new books together. Joined at the Heart examines the state of the American family, and the spirit of family also explores the subject of family through a collection of some 250 photographs. I am pleased to have both of them at this table. Let me talk about family here, the Gore family. Mm. It is said that you, the children, would like him to run for president in 2004. True? Well, I can tell you the truth, and that is that all of us have talked about this from at various times, and all of us want to support him no matter what decision he makes. We will support him if he runs. We will support him if he decides not to run. But what do you say when it comes to a vote? Tipper votes yes. It hasn't come to a vote yet. <laughs> <laughs> but They're very supportive either way. I mean, yeah. that's uh, I couldn't possibly ask for more. I, I'm very grateful for yeah. the, the blessing that my family is to me. One of the things you say in this book, you, you talk about the value of family councils and, and what yeah. they can mean. Yeah, family meetings. Family mm -hmm. meetings. Mm -hmm. uh, is that what will take place here somehow? <laughs> You'll come to <laughs> together sometime between now and January? Uh, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I haven't ruled out running again, but I'm going to wait till the end of the year. And over the holidays, uh, we will talk together as a family, and I'll uh, spend some private time by myself. and. Sometime after the holidays, I'll make an announcement as to whether I'll run or not. Do the midterm election results make it likely or less likely? Um, I didn't. Uh, well, first of all, I was disappointed by the results of the midterm elections. And uh, I enjoyed your commentary on it, incidentally. I thought it was very well stated. Um, I, I didn't uh, feel that it had any real impact on uh, my thinking of about 2004, right. you know, the old cliche, two years is a lifetime yeah. in politics. And uh, I, I think that um, the Republican Party, now in control of both houses of Congress as well as the White House, uh, will find it more difficult to pass the buck and shift blame when, th when and if things go wrong. I hope they don't, but the economy doesn't look good and uh, there are. A, a lot of problems that have emerged in the past two years. So I, I don't know uh, all of the thinking now about how uh, uh, they're riding high and all that. Uh, that could change because everything 
usually does change in politics. And a day is a lifetime in politics. And two years is forever. Yeah. But what factors will make it? Will be, what do you look at? I mean, what, in my decision yeah, to run again? Decision. Um, do you want it? Does it burn in your gut? Is that Well, I'd like to be president again, but yeah. it's not just a personal choice. Um, I would want to know uh, that, I would want to feel like I was the best candidate for the Democrats and had the best chance to, uh, to win the race as opposed to any other potential nominee. Sure. Uh, but uh, most, most of the factors I'll take into account are ones that are personal and uh, I'll just, uh, you know, just reflect on it personally yeah. after the, during the holidays and announce it after. Does it enter into the consideration, um, A, how much money you can raise clearly is a factor? No. no, that's not a factor. No. The fact that you think you can, that you have something to say, that you have a vision to offer the country that is different from the one offered by the president is clearly a factor. Uh, sure. Uh, Charlie, look, uh, I, I'm concerned about the direction of our country. I, I don't think we're headed in the right direction. The economy is not doing well. Uh, I, I think that uh, the focus on the war against terrorism has uh, not been uh, what it should be. Uh, we're, we're losing ground in Afghanistan. Yeah. We've lost focus on uh, al-Qaeda. Um, I, I think there are many, uh, the environmental policy that we're following is uh, one that I'm very deeply concerned about. I, I think that w we really need to make significant changes. So th those are the kinds of things that I care deeply about. But, uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not uh, um, going to make that decision until later, and I'm not anxious to get into a, mm. you know, a frontal assault on uh, the Bush administration right now. We've just had an election, and uh, we've been we've been engaged for two years now in in uh, uh, writing and uh, producing uh, these two books, and we're going to be spending uh, the next month talking about uh, the American family, some of the changes that have been taking place. A lot of them really revolutionary. All right, I want to talk about that, but and that's why I wanted to to bring Tipper in. I say Tipper because we've known each other for a long time. A long time. Thank so, goodness. Thank you for, your, uh, for being here. Yeah. And you can call me out. <laughs> I'll call you. As I don't have to say mistakes. Things. Yeah. Exactly. Call me out. Yeah. Uh, let me yeah. raise the question of this book, and, yes. and then we'll come back to both political and social issues and, and the essential transformation of the American family. Uh, right. Whose idea? Did you guys sit together and say, what do we want to do together? Let's <clears throat> talk about something that we have been involved in thinking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, we both wanted to do these two books and um, we've had family conferences for 11 years Al began them um, along with with me when he was in the Senate uh, we had our 11th annual one and all these conferences this is in 2002 this year mm -hmm. yes yeah. we last just month. had it last yeah. month right. so um, we've been interested in this issue and in how you strengthen families and in how families uh, work and work well um, for many, many years. And we always thought that we would be able to write these books together and look forward to it. The only thing is we did not expect to have the free time <laughs> granted to us <laughs> uh, after the election. We, yeah, we thought later. we would yeah. do this maybe right. a little bit later. But yeah. you know, when uh, Al likes to, to joke um, that he was uh, the first one laid off. <laughs> and um, Just before noon. Just before yeah, noon, right. exactly. January 20th. Right. You right. never your... forget something like that. <laughs> no. We've, we've come to take your office. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, and so yeah. given, given, given that fact, um, we were very seriously thought, well, we can do this now. And yeah. so we dug in and we have worked very hard to produce these two books in the last Yeah, we've been months. eager to we've been eager to do this for a while. We've yeah. been learning a lot. Uh, Everybody learns from their own family, which we've done. But right. we've had the we've had the chance, well, to look at family policy right. from the vantage point of the White House. But over this 11-year period, we've had an opportunity to meet with the leading family policy experts and the grassroots practitioners who work with families all over the United States. So we've been eager to 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 share what we've learned. And when we got had this free time, as Tipper said, we didn't expect it. Then this was naturally what we first uh, turned our attention to. And uh, we had collaborated uh, years ago when we both worked for the same newspaper in Tennessee. 
and uh, we thought it would be fun, and it, and it, and it has been fun. Was that the Tennessean or the banner? It was the Tennessean. National yeah. Tennessean. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. He was a reporter, as right. you know, and, and I was a photographer. How did you pick, decide on who would represent these different points of view, and how much time did you two spend with them? Lots. lots. Yeah, lots of times. Lots of times. Well, we met some of these families through the family reunion conferences right. that we just described the over the last right. 11 years. Some people we met uh, just through our, our personal lives and they became friends, like um, uh, Pat uh, Alexander and, and Todd Alexander. Um, and what we did was, um, I let Al be an reporter again. Yeah. <laughs> he went out. We and met one pencil on paper and went out and talked right. to them. Yeah. Well, we, one family we met 13 years ago. Yeah. Uh, in some ways the catalyst for this big book goes back 13 years. Our youngest child was in a serious accident and almost died. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, he's fine now, he mm -hmm. made a full recovery. One of the principal but, reasons you didn't run for president in 92. Uh, back, back when. And uh, uh, that shook me to my core. It shook our whole family to its core. And we started uh, searching for ways to make our family better and stronger and looking at uh, changes that we could make. And, and the family reunion process really began after that. Yeah. Now, a little boy who was in the critical care unit in the bed next to our son uh, was named Brett Philpott. Yeah. And we became very close friends with his parents and we followed them, stayed in touch. They actually got divorced uh, a few years later because of the pressure of taking care of Brett, who has very, very serious disabilities. He can't speak, he can't walk, he can't see. But he, he is pure love, he radiates love. And uh, his mom, Cindy, is now remarried to a man named Lee Nally. Uh, and his dad, Mitch, uh, Remarried, it didn't work. It's a long story, but now he's single for right. sure. <laughs> and the three of them take care of Brett uh, together in two different homes. And they switch custody every single day and every weekend. A and they organize their whole lives. A creative way of keeping the family together. An incredibly creative yeah. well, way. Well, yes, you've got three adults caring. They're sharing the, they're sharing the responsibility. Right. Um, but. The other astounding thing is this child has never had a babysitter. Yeah, they had an agreement in the custody <laughs> agreement that, that if the other uh, parent ever needed a babysitter to give the first parent, the right. other parent yeah. a first uh, chance, and they've never needed one. Mitch, incidentally, refers to Lee, Cindy's new husband, as his husband-in-law. Wow. <laughs> and extended yeah. family. Yeah. Now, exactly. that, it's an new amazing family. New, new family. kind of family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of the issues, regardless of the nature of the family, and, and you talk about this near the end of the book, some of the issues that are necessary to protect the family have to do with political realities as well. Sure. Speak to that in terms of daycare, in terms of, of a whole range of access to, it has to do with health care, yeah. daycare, yeah. a whole series of issues uh, that are essential. Yeah. We have a whole families chapter. to <laughs> survive since they've changed. We have a whole chapter on uh, resilience, right. Charlie. Well, what makes for resilience? Sometimes it's found in an individual within the family. Often it's found in the family itself and its practices. But sometimes it's found in the neighborhood, in the, in the community. And in order for the community to play that role, that often means there has to be uh, a framework of policy that allows for something like uh, after school care, for example. Yeah. There are millions of families who, who get off of, where the adults get off of work long uh, after the children are let out of school. So some become latchkey kids, right. others uh, go to the street corner. That's the most common time for kids to get in trouble for it, drug abuse, juvenile offenses, etc. cetera. And, and, and yet if there is a, uh, a community effort to provide uh, after school programs for these kids, that makes those families more resilient it makes it more likely that they'll be able to stay together and do right by their kids. A political question. How much of this is the responsibility of state, local, national government in terms of providing facilities and resources and money, and how much of it can be taken care of by a community effort, private sector? Charity-based, faith-based faith mm -hmm. groups of the, mm -hmm. of the 
combination. I, I think it's safe to say that more of it can be taken care of at the community level than, than most people think. However, not enough. Uh, not enough. And in, in lower income <coughs> communities, communities with fewer resources, often um, it, it will not take place unless there's a national framework. But here, here's another, we have a whole chapter on work right. in, in this book and, and the pressures that work puts on families. And here's why it's relevant to this question you've asked. Americans are now the hardest working people on the face of this earth in industrial countries, yeah. three weeks per year more than the average Japanese. Right. And that time comes away from, from sleep, from family, and also from community involvement. So the ability of families like the Wallaces to organize programs like this, you'll get extraordinary people like Tony and Linda Wallace, but for the average, uh, for the average family, if you're exhausted after work, you're pulling a lot of overtime, you come home just burned out, yeah. turn on the TV, it's, it's just plain more difficult to get out in the community and, and organize things. Well, we are saying, too, that in, in our book that you know, there's a problem, there's a sort of a deficit for civic involvement because of these reasons, because of um, problems with balancing work and family, um, sleep deprivation, other kinds of things. But it doesn't mean that communities shouldn't wake up to what they can do. Let me bring this back to the personal because of something you said. The, your son, Baltimore, I think it was Memorial Stadium at that time. That's right, it? yeah. You know, right. Where the Orioles play. Right. Uh, was hit by a car, mm -hmm. almost lost his life. You, he said it shook the family, meaning just mm -hmm. the sheer horror of having to fear the loss of your child or more. Is it more that you're talking about than the sheer horror? Well, we learned a lot of lessons about family dynamics in yeah. that. Uh, for so, example, well, family yeah. pacing, that kind of right. crisis, well, learn about each other and learn. Absolutely. I mean, it, it hap these kinds of things happen to, to families right. and life. I it, mean, you know, it, it, a traumatic, illness. exactly, something you don't expect that's traumatic, that, that really impacts the, you know, families going along with a certain rhythm, everything, and then boom. And you've got to, re you've got to come back and figure out how you're going to deal. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we learned and that we wanted to share and we've talked about before is, you know, family counseling. I mean, was helpful to us. So people in the hospital said, you know, we notice you want your older girls to go on as if nothing's happened in their life, to continue mm -hmm. their routines. And we were shouldering the burden mm -hmm. as adults. Mm -hmm. And they said, why not give them each a role to play in their brother's recovery? And then, mm -hmm. okay, th you know, thank yeah. you very much. We were trying to insulate them, but, th but they wanted <laughs> yeah. to be a part of it and take the burden. And so they took turns staying up with them all night. Yeah. We, we had a hospital bed in the, uh, in the dining room uh, of, of our home because he's in a full body cast and so forth. But the point is, when they were able to play a, a major role in helping the family cope, it, it helped to make them whole with their own grief and their own feelings about it. And uh, we, we interviewed a lot of families in this book who, who tell a story similar to that about how they learned from the challenges that mm -hmm. they faced. They pulled them together. Right. Absolutely, and, yeah. and you know what? There is no family in America where if, if you spend the time with that family and get beneath the surface, you will find the most incredible stories, every family. And you'll be surprised, a lot of the readers, that is, will be surprised at what they have shared with us about the things that, that go on beneath the surface. As you got to know these families, they Absolutely. Shared, shared the innermost thoughts that might not have otherwise right. at first glance. I run the politics just for a few minutes. This, we just went through an important election with yeah. important issues. Yeah. Uh, and, and you are one Democrat that America wants to hear from. Uh, one question is whether you can run for president. Mm. The other is your sense of what's happened at the United Nations Security mm. Council. And what does that mean in your judgment? You said in a famous speech in San Francisco mm -hmm. at the Commonwealth Club, you know, that Iraq, if it detracts from the right. war against terrorism, might not be the right time right. to go after Iraq. Has what happened at the United Nations for you changed the equation with respect to what the president should do? I think the president deserves credit for getting a, a unanimous vote in the Security Council. I think he and Secretary Powell did an excellent job of negotiating that, uh, wrestling it to the ground and, and negotiating a, a, a unanimous resolution. 
Now, they changed their policy in the process of doing that, and, and they traded off uh, a lot of things. And the, the new policy is much closer to what I uh, was talking about in San Francisco than, uh, than what they were embarked on sometime before. It doesn't surprise me because I think the international political realities push in that direction. But we don't know where this is going to go from here. But if, in fact, Saddam refuses to, incept, to accept the inspectors or refuses to allow them access uh, to possible sites mm -hmm. of weapons of mass destruction and then they kick it back to the Security Council and the Security Council either does or does not. It looks like the President has said if the Security Council doesn't take measures that are necessary, mm -hmm. the United States and its allies that it can bring together for this journey mm -hmm. will go. Do mm -hmm. you support the President? at that point. Well, you've strung together about four hypotheticals right. in, in, in a row, and I'd like to know exactly what the situation is a, at the time. But the simple answer to your question is, if the United Nations uh, is the, the aggrieved party, right. and the United Nations is enforcing its resolution, then that's a very different situation. Should we join in an international force under the the uh, umbrella of the United Nations, yes, uh, because I think that he's, as I said in San Francisco, he is in uh, breach of the resolutions that ended the war in 1991. And so that's a very different but, situation. But the president has reserved the right to go ahead, even if the Security Council does not pass. Yeah, well, that, I, I would, would want to know the situation at the yeah, time. But you're likely to, you know, if the United Nations Security Council cannot uh, after much debate, come up with a resolution to take action, and the president decides to. Yeah. Well, I, I'd want to know the situation at the time. I mean, these are lots yeah. of hypotheticals together at the risk of, you know, I, it, it, you don't know what uh, the situation is going to be. I was one of uh, only a handful of About Democrats 11, 10, 11, when who it, supported yeah. the resolution to go to war in 1991. And what was different then from what was taking place uh, uh, two months ago is there, there uh, were no allies in the region that were supporting us. Uh, he had, Saddam had invaded another country and was actively uh, occupying it. Uh, and that, that's a very different situation. Now, uh, it, it, it appears that a serious vote in the Security Council, I don't know that that means they're uh, allied with us. I, <laughs> I don't yeah. think, you know, there'd have to be a change there in Syria sure, before that we could ever call them they that. They haven't been convinced to do it in the but idea the, of unanimity. But uh, the uh, opinions in the Arab world, I think, uh, appear to be changing in the wake of the UN resolution. So let's see how it plays out. I hope it, do I hope it goes for the best. But I think America would like to hear your, and you said some of them at that speech in San Francisco. What do you think the risk is? For the United States, if in fact it decides to go to war, yeah. either with Britain and with Italy and with some friends, with that UN Security Council, or even if it does, yeah. is there still a risk because the war against terrorism continues, and are we building a kind of, of uh, deepening fissure between the United States and the rest of the world? Well, I, I think the I think there's been progress in the last two months. I, I mean, I think the president uh, clearly. Uh, changed course and decided to invest heavily in the United Nations. In a multilateral effort. To the point where, you know, those on the right wing in his party are beginning to criticize uh, what he's done. I think that's a measure of it. Um, depending on what happens, would might there still be risk in going forward? Yeah. yeah. But it would be higher or lower depending upon uh, what the situation was, uh, whether the UN had endorsed uh, going forward, uh, whether other nations were in favor of it or not. But independent of all that, Charlie, there, there are another set of risks here, and that is uh, losing focus on the war against terrorism. Now, I, I know the administration's tried to, to sort of uh, lump uh, uh, Osama bin Laden and Saddam Hussein together in, almost as if they were practically the same person. Right. They're, they're not. And try as they may, they have not yet publicly presented any evidence linking them. There may be some linkage. If so, I'd like to see it. It would change a lot of things no for me. No one has seen the evidence yet. And so uh, maintaining the focus on this international organization that was responsible for the, uh, the horrible attacks on us of September 11th 
I think is very important. And anything that, that diminishes that focus, I think, adds another risk factor. But the administration that you served ably as vice president, and I think the president said more than one time, it was unacceptable for Saddam Hussein to have weapons oh, of yes, mass destruction. Oh, yes, that's right. And I've made it and clear. And you cannot live with that I'm in favor of, uh, of a regime change there, of him being removed from, from power. Now, that's been taken off the table as a goal by the present administration, at least formally. And, and they expressed it as disarmament. Yes, and I'm sure they would still like to see him removed uh, from power, but they've removed that as a, as a formal goal. Now, um, I, I've said repeatedly, I, you know, I think that uh, he needs to be removed. I've said that if you're going after Jesse James, you ought to organize the posse first. Well, I think they've made good steps in organizing a posse. Whether it's really there or not, whether it will stick, as this process plays out uh, in the weeks ahead, time will tell. Okay, you seem to be saying whether the president was listening to Colin Powell, Brent Scowcroft, Al Gore, or others. I don't think he was listening to me. <laughs> well, I, he probably heard your voice uh, in terms of the arguments being made, yeah. that he seems to have moved to a more moderate position with respect to Iraq, in your judgment. It certainly seems that way to me. And rather than more moderate, I would I, say it's more, a bad word. I don't more know realistic. Right word. Okay. More, more realistic. Uh, you can't just uh, uh, thumb your nose at the entire world and say, we're going to go and do whatever we want to do regardless of the consequences. That may feel good to say that, but you're going to stir up a lot of opposition to the U.S. around the world and buy us some trouble on down the road. And there's some signs, there have been some signs of that. So I think that uh, investing as heavily as he did in the United Nations process I think was wise. Okay. The war against terrorism, is there something the president should be doing and the administration should be doing that they're not doing? Yeah, absolutely. We should have, uh, we should support uh, an international force of 35 to 40,000 troops in Afghanistan to establish uh, uh, peace and end the violence there. Yeah. We should have done that right after our troops won, won the war. Uh, that's what we did in Bosnia. That's what we did in Kosovo. You know, uh, after all that fighting that had been going on there, uh, the different factions had high blood pressure and they were quick to take uh, an insult. And uh, that's the same situation that we face in Bosnia, but with a big enough force to impose peace and say, hey, there's a new sheriff in town, y'all behave now. They did, and over time, their blood pressures went down and they began to see they could cooperate with one another. And then they began to establish some local and then regional and then national political mm -hmm. institutions. And that could happen in Afghanistan also. We've lost a lot of time along with the ground we've lost, but there is still time to do that. All right. Let me move to some questions about politics for you. 2000, the campaign of 2000. What are your regrets about it other than the fact that you won the popular vote but didn't win the presidency. <laughs> well, <laughs> Which that's is a pretty the big one. There is that. There is that. That's that kind of what, I mean, did fills you, the page, <laughs> <laughs> actually. Did it, how long did it take you to get over that? Um. No. <laughs> so far. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no? no? No, you're not kidding, are you? No. Yeah. A part of me is... It's been two it's years funny. and six months. I'm, 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 I, I play too many jokes in the family, I think. You know, right. Oh, sometimes they're telling. Oh, they are. <laughs> uh, time will tell. <laughs> yes, we, we'll see if it ever happens. Yes, we will. Okay, but there must have been some lessons. I mean, did, were, were there things about this campaign that you... What would you like to redo? Oh, let me just Did he run you. the right campaign? Did oh he listen gosh. to the right advisors? Did he take the right task? Did he handle the relationship with the president well, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Which of those should we pick up on? Any or all of them. Okay, the relationship with the president. I'd love to give you my That's perspective on, okay. on all of them. I let would. me say this, because I think, um, I think Al has done the right thing. You, you played his concession speech part of it as we opened the program. I was very proud of that, and I think that he has been very dignified. And I think that he has allowed the new president to establish himself. That was his intention. And then he was thinking about, you know, making some speeches. And then 9-11 happened. So it was, again, proper and dignified to, to hold back and, and to just, you know, be quiet. And that's what we've done. That's what he's done. Um, 
Now, as you noticed, he'd started to make yeah. some remarks. One on uh, the Iraq, one on the economy. Exactly. And, and I think that's fantastic. I mean, this is a person that cares about the democratic uh, values and the democratic values and principles that we have dedicated you know, 24 years of our lives to up until now in terms of public service are still there and they are much greater than people and they continue to be made vibrant by people like Al Gore and others speaking to them and talking about what's good for the country. Now, I'm having said that, right. having said that, I couldn't help but notice over the last 18 months as we, um, as he maintained his dignified silence, that a lot of people had a lot of things to say. Mm. And all I want to do is say this. I think that the millions of people that worked hard in the campaign, the, the many millions that voted, certainly, you know, the, the majority that voted for Al Gore and Joe Lieberman as opposed to the current president, I thank them. And for all those that worked really hard in the campaign, and I'm not going to talk about the consultants and this and that. I'm talking about the volunteers and the people that got involved at the local level in their community and worked for the candidate they believed in and they worked for him. They worked hard and they deserve to be thanked and they deserve to be acknowledged for their hard work because it showed in the fact that he got more votes than any Democrat in history. Now other people can just pick apart this and that all they want to. I want to look at the big picture, yeah. and that's what I see, and that's what I want to address, and I don't think people really have. Okay, but do I hear you saying in that eloquent point that, uh, look, whatever was wrong with the campaign, we got more votes than the other guy. We did something right, and a lot of people gave up a lot of time, a lot of resources, right. and worked long hours in order to help us do that. That's exactly and let's right. let's not lose sight of them. And they did, they did a great job. And I did a bunch of things wrong. And well, I accept the responsibility for, personally, for the things that went tell wrong. Tell me what they were, and that's what I'd love to have you just tell me. What is it that you did wrong? You know, if I had it to do over again, right. uh, you know, uh, again, I don't know if I'm going to run, but if I do run again, I would do it very differently, and I would spend most of my time on two things. I, I would meet with people in small groups and one-on-one -on -one and really engage in in-depth conversations about uh, wh where they're really at and learn as much as I can. And the second thing is I would spend time trying to find the, the best words straight from my heart about the most important challenges the country is facing and, and write it out myself and do my best to, to, to present it. Everything else in the campaign, like all these media events and focus uh, groups and all, all that, that stuff, I would I would spend much less, if any, time on all of those other things. Mm -hmm. And where the consultants are concerned, I I appreciate what they did too. I think they did a great job. I think mm -hmm. there were times when there were factors that they couldn't take into account because they were just inside me, where I should have trusted my own judgment more yeah. and not. Uh, and, and not uh, gone with the, you know, the, all the yeah. strategy and stuff like that. Then why did you do it? I mean, you've been around oh, for I was a... trying to win, trying okay. to win the race. Okay, but you've been around for a while, and you're yeah. now seeing yeah. you recognize that the best shot you had at winning the race was being yourself. Well, and I... that somehow through focus groups and people telling you this and people telling you that, that you became something other. We saw it I, in I... the debates in part. Mm. It was here one day, and then the next debate it seemed to be here, whereas... The Al Gore that had been so brilliant at, in debates with Ross Perot didn't seem to emerge. Hmm. I don't know if well, you agree with that, yeah, but that's a, what... That's a long story, okay. and there's a lot involved, but I, I think that... Uh, let's take that first debate, for okay. example. And this is all ancient history now. I know, but we we're interested in it because it's I'm a sense of what lessons you learned yeah. as you think about the mm -hmm. future. I thought, you know, if you take away the so-called reaction shots where they caught me sighing at some yeah, of his questions, yeah. I thought that you won. I, I thought the debate went extremely well. I think we lost the spin afterwards. I think we, I think that, uh, and 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 in fact, the uh, public opinion surveys showed that people thought I won that debate. But then the news coverage of the reaction and all that, the sighing, um, that overtook the the uh, the the actual reality of the of the debate and the substance of the debate. 
And so the only thing I can say about that is... <sighs> <laughs> yes, then let's see, there you go, there you go. It is the notion that most people who know him and talk about him always say, you don't see the public, the private guy that everybody knows as funny and interesting and, and all of those kind of things somehow doesn't emerge in the public guy. You, you read that, right? Yes, I, I have. I've read, read it. I understand the, the, the stereotype that yeah. exists about him yeah. and then got repeated and repeated and repeated and became... Concrete. It became one became more example concrete. of how what was written became the reality. Became the reality. Became but concrete. You know, you know, there was a song that yeah. Janis Joplin sang. It was actually uh -huh. written by Chris Christopherson yeah. in Tennessee uh, that has the line, Freedom's just another uh -huh. word for nothing left to lose. That's the way I feel. You right are a free man. <laughs> That's the way I feel. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. so you will be your own man if you decide to run. It would Regardless say, whether regard, I do or not. It, or run or not, in uh, terms of, that was a life's lesson, in fact. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. and I, you know, I think it was way overstated to the, you know, the extent that, I mean, I, before, I, I think that, uh, that, that uh, I sometimes uh, got into tactics more than uh, just concentrating on putting out exactly what I thought the best solutions for the country's challenges were. And uh, whether I run again or not, I, I'm not ever going to make that mistake, because there's you know there's no point to it. I, you just uh, you know the most important lessons in life, as far as I'm concerned, and I, I've seen some evidence that others have had the same experience. The most important lessons come from setbacks. Mm -hmm. rather than from smooth sailing. Of course they do. So I've had a great chance to learn some yeah. lessons. <laughs> Failure, and, and how sure. we characterize it, is a Absolutely. great teacher. The, one of the other things that comes up is the relationship with the president and President Clinton. And there are two arguments. One is that the people came along. You couldn't separate an, an obvious feeling of pride and being an essential partner mm -hmm. in, in the economic mm -hmm growth that had taken place in America during the Clinton administration, that because of the questions of personal conduct, you could never separate those two in an effective way. And some say, well, he got a lot of advice that he had to run away from President Clinton, and it was not, and that became part of the campaign. Others say it was Al Gore to the core, and that he wanted to run as his own man, and well, he did was... not want to run. Uh, as a college, Bill Clinton. He wanted to run as his own man. And uh, that was what was important. And if you had to risk losing some vote, you'd do it. Well, you know, um, actually it was kind of neither of those things. Yeah. What everybody uh, I talked with out on the campaign trail told me is they, they wanted to hear about the future and not, not the past. And Bill Clinton and I are great friends. Uh, we continue to be great friends. I've heard him say many times, all campaigns are about the future and not the past. And that was true in 2000 also. Uh, and in virtually every stump speech I made all along the campaign trail, I spent considerable time talking about the great achievements of the Clinton-Gore administration and all, that, all the good things that the happened while we were, we were in office. Yeah, that's right. And so a surplus you know, and not a deficit. The, the, the part of the myth now is that I didn't talk about that. I did talk about that at practically every occasion. But did you use Bill Clinton as well as you should have in that election? I, I would not. I would not change that decision. I accept responsibility for making a lot of mistakes in my campaign. I don't think that was one of them. And it what had it not because of uh, the Monica Lewinsky scam or anything like that. You know, the American people are smart enough to separate those things out. Not up to me to separate them. The American people separate that. They know that he was a great president. They know the achievements uh, uh, during his time as president. And they know that, uh, like everybody, he's a human being. And they long since have put that in, in perspective. But where economic policy or any other policy is concerned, what they wanted to hear about was what's going to happen in the next four years, not what happened in the last eight years. As, as a predicate for what I was proposing, I did talk about it. But uh, to, uh, to, to have the focus be on the past, I thought was, was a mistake. Right. Let me talk about the future and the economy. And incidentally, yeah. uh, uh, without making any excuses, I do sometimes honestly believe that if the Supreme Court had voted five to four the other way, some of those same people would say, 
Boy, that was a smart strategy. He really threaded the <laughs> needle right. on that. Depends on whether you win or lose <laughs> yeah. as to whether, looking but, back, the strategy worked or didn't work. Um, it didn't. The economy, <laughs> it didn't. Uh, the, and, and you actually, I'd forgotten in that speech, the concession speech, said, let this be final. Yeah. You know, let's not spend the rest of our life saying, you know, what yeah. might have been. Yeah. Or mm. we have to put this and move on and support the yeah. president. The country's then, moved on, I've moved yeah. on. And then in 9-11, you referred to the president of the commander-in-chief. Absolutely. And I'm supporting my commander-in-chief. Uh, on the economy, yeah. which was not evidently a big issue in this midterm election. Yet we have gone from a surplus to a deficit. You know what's happened to the stock market. Yeah. You know what's happened to unemployment. Uh, unemployment. You know, interest rates are down. But tell me, where did the Democrats, what should be, and with you specifically, a recommendation for getting the economy where it was mm -hmm. when the Clinton Gore administration turned over power? Well, and do you start with, do you start with, and is it politically viable to roll back the tax cut? Oh, I think surely you should roll back the parts that are yet to take effect for the upper income groups, which is the majority of it, not for the middle income taxpayers. So you are saying we in fact should? Oh yeah, sure. Roll back the tax cut that has I hasn't. said during the campaign we ought to take the Bush-Cheney economic plan and completely rip it up and start over from no, you scratch. You did say that during the camp midterm election campaign. Absolutely, and, and, and incidentally I believe that. Uh, and, and this is not just about uh, you know, a, a political choice, Charlie. Look, people are people are hurting because of this economic policy. We personally know lots of people who have been laid off and who have lost their jobs. There are millions of them, a and there there are millions who have lost a big share of their pensions and their 401ks, and uh, millions more who've lost their investments in the stock market or the majority of their investments. Uh, and this country has lost many trillions of dollars worth of wealth. Look, is this that because of the Bush administration, or is it because simply the business cycle? Is it because of the dot com implosion, which you some, know, the Bush some, administration didn't create it, that? Absolutely, that's fair. Some of it would have happened anyway. Some of, for example, the the dot com bubble would right. have burst regardless, regardless of who had been president. <clears throat> the business cycle was turning and, and and started to turn in March of of two thousand, no question. But the consensus projection of most all the economists. Uh, as we ended the year 2000, was that we had a chance to 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 have a very uh, short f period of flat economic growth without going into a recession, and then start coming back up again. What happened? Bush and Cheney took the Clinton-Gore economic plan and scrapped it, notwithstanding the fact that it had produced the strongest economy in history and all the great results, and they they reversed it. And we said at the time, look, uh, I said at the time, this is going to eliminate our surpluses and put us back into deficit. Oh, no, they said, it's not, it's not going to happen. When, what they said well, was that this is the taxpayer's money and we're going to return it to them. Well, and, and they said it would not produce a deficit, right. but it did, a, a huge one. And now all the surpluses are, are gone. They said it wouldn't produce higher unemployment. They said it would, would uh, have a stronger boom. Well, you've seen the results. And... and now, it, w it didn't take a rocket scientist to predict that result because it, it, was, it was obvious, I, I thought, and not just me, lots of people said, if, if you give a huge, huge tax cut to, to the wealthy, increase spending in these various other areas, you're going to produce a giant deficit. Now, a deficit by itself doesn't have to be a huge problem. But at a time when we are already borrowing lots of money from the rest of the world, when, when our trade deficit is gigantic and our so-called current accounts deficit is at record levels, that puts our economy in jeopardy. And so deficits in that kind of situation lead to, and did lead to, a reduced level of confidence in the U.S. economy and in the dollar. And so you had investors taking money out of the economy. Mm -hmm. Then when all of the uh, uh, the corporate abuse came to light they did not act decisively to to enforce the rules and say the people who cut corners are not going to be allowed to get away with it instead incredibly well, they have allowed some of the abusers to veto the selection of uh, a tough cop on that beat and to and to put in somebody that they that they feel comfortable yeah, but, but with. But as soon as you say that, as you know, I mean, Mr. Fastow's been indicted 
uh, and other members from Enron, you know, and and people. Yeah, from the most, some of the most egregious uh, cases have you know, been had pursued what they call in the, the courts. For these guys, absolutely, but. But they haven't changed the, the rules. The structural change. And the, you know, having uh, enforcing criminal laws, good. I'm glad they. I'm glad they're starting to do that. They've been slow to do it, but but changing the the rules that allowed these abuses, that they haven't done, and their strongest supporters do, don't want those rules changed, mm. and they have been unwilling to buck their their strong supporters. That's why they. Uh, they took that accounting supervising job away from the fellow who was going to be the tough cop on the beat. After they offered it to him, after he changed his life to accept the job, right. then they got a call from the lobbyists for the big accounting firms, and they said, oh, we're going to change our minds, and they yanked it away from him. Big scandal, and should be a big scandal. And then had the whole, all the problems with the successor that they were thinking about. Let me just come finally to the environment, a subject that was mm -hmm. a mm -hmm. your last book. Um, I saw Peter Matheson last night. Ah, yeah. He just returned from Anwar. Mm. He said it's the most beautiful thing oh. place he'd ever seen in his world, mm -hmm. in his life, and he's seen a lot of beautiful places. Do you believe that there will be drilling in Anwar, or do you believe that the political majority mm. is against it? Oh, there's no question that the majority the of the American is people it. Yeah. are against but it. But the political and I system that, will... I hope that the... I, I hope that those who oppose it will prevail in defeating this plan. It's a very ill-advised plan. They, they cannot, the Bush-Cheney administration appears to be unable to confront this huge uh, addiction to oil that's causing foreign policy and national security problems, getting us into deeper and deeper debt, and, and fouling the environment simultaneously. Their answer is, let's, let's get more and more oil and burn more and more oil. And then they cut the budgets for solar and some of the uh, alternatives mm -hmm. and conservation. And that stuff, you know, that's not a pipe dream. Other countries are starting to make that work real well. And we need to, have, we need to stand up to the, uh, to, to the ones in the oil industry that are pushing for these unwise steps like drilling in this beautiful, pristine uh, area of Alaska. And on Kyoto and those treaties, you would have been... Well, look, global warming, uh, I, do we... Uh, do we still have an hour left to talk about global warming? <laughs> I mean, we have a couple of minutes. It is the, yeah. you know, it is the most serious environmental challenge we face by far. And they, the first promise broken in this administration was uh, on global warming. Mm -hmm. He talked in the campaign as if he was going to take it seriously. He, right. uh, he, he, he backed off that. And you know that uh, the, 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 the oil companies and the coal companies actually wrote their energy plan. They are still in defiance of a court order. To disclose the names of people in, who came in. And being unwilling right. to say who wrote the nation's energy right. plan now. He, Am I missing something here? <laughs> no, I think you've got it the way you see it. It is, this, there's finally this. Uh, George Bush had a, yeah. an extraordinarily successful midterm election. He yeah. had a successful he campaign did. across he the did. country yeah. and, and put his political capital at risk. Yeah and was successful. He was. Majority in both houses, and you say the test now comes whether the Republican Party can do the things it says, because there's no one to blame, because it's got the majority. And the test comes to Democrats uh, to, to hold see, the line where uh, fundamental to draw values the line are at stake. Values Absolutely. Stake, yeah. We have to be, Democrats have to be the loyal opposition in reality and not just in name. Where, where we agree, we need to be uh, open-hearted and, and agree well. But where we disagree and where principles are at stake, we need to draw the line and defend it hard. Will he be a tougher candidate uh, in 2004 than he was in 2000? Oh, I don't know. I have, I have no idea. But he has probably, because of 9-11, circumstances thrust on him, and because of this campaign, in a sense, advanced his credibility. Oh, sure. And his legitimacy. Hey, look, and after 9-11. After capacity for leadership. After 9-11, I was one of the first to heap praise on him. And, and I, I think he did a terrific job in rallying the country in the immediate aftermath of 9-11. No question about it. I was proud of him, and it takes a lot for me to be <laughs> proud of him after, you know, us being at, uh, at loggerheads. But I really admired what he did. Now, I think that uh, after a few months, they started making serious mistakes, and then after that, they began to lose focus. And did not use the goodwill they had around the world, it would be the Squandered point. it. Squandered it. Um,
listen to that passion. I watch you looking at him. Um, mm -hmm. Life comes around. Few people, men or women, are given the opportunity uh, to have a shot, to be at the top ranks of an opportunity to lead a country, to talk about values that you appreciate, like families, to mm -hmm. be able to uh, to put in action things you believe in, to mm -hmm. see the country be, be what you believe it can be. And if he says, I want to go, you say? There's nothing new here. I have, <laughs> I have told him <laughs> that if he wants to Honey, this is the Charlie Rose. <laughs> yeah. okay. Charlie, he needs okay. something new on that, too. In addition to all the other new things. Okay. I need something new. Exactly. Yes. Yes, this is an exclusive. If he decides yes. that he is going to run again, yes. man, I'm there. You're ready. I'm ready. I will, I th I will be, I think it will be terrific. I know he would be a wonderful uh, but president. Your, but I also know yeah. that there are a lot of ways to be significant in helping others. Yeah, that's the, in not the country, only place in the world you can and in your life. And what if yeah. I choose one of those other ways? Are you and there? I'm there <laughs> exactly. if he chooses one of the other ways. Too. And then come on, more and more. Yeah. Now, what? And, and if he says, <laughs> if he says, I want you to tell me what you want me to do before <laughs> I say what I want to do. Well, what are you going to say? In every tough decision he's ever made in his life, yeah. he's always asked me beforehand. Yeah. And then he goes. And he makes so his I'm own asking decision. you, what are you going to tell him? I've already told him. I just told you on the show. It's exclusive. You said you're going to go with wherever he goes. I'm saying if he says, <laughs> I want you to tell me whether you think I should go, you're going to say. Because the, the, the conventional well, wisdom. Well, we haven't had that wisdom. conversation yet. Okay, but but the conventional we'll, we'll have that conversation over the, over the holidays. Okay. And the conventional wisdom, what I'll is tell the you. Conventional wisdom? He's saying the conventional wisdom is that you want me. To, to run. run. We did an interview oh. uh, yesterday yeah. where somebody said the conventional wisdom is that she doesn't want me to run. Oh my goodness. And the convention, I'll, I'll tell you what the it, real wisdom is. Just, yeah. we she's told me that whatever I, yeah, we haven't decided <laughs> and whatever I want, she's going to be supportive of it. Yeah. But, and you, you know, you put this dramatically yeah. when you say there are few people to whom this opportunity comes. Well, it's come to me twice already. <laughs> <laughs> so, in, in 1980 so, something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. In 80, in 1992. yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. then in, in 2000. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes three is a good time, you know. <laughs> Not, three strikes and you're out, and you only had two strikes. Well, look, if we get really close to making the decision, yeah, yeah. and we're right here, it, would you want us back? I would. I would. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I've been All getting right. that impression. Yeah. Thank right. you. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Yeah. Let me remind the people joined at the heart the transformation of the American family, Al and Tipper Gore, and these photographs, the spirit of family, Al and Tipper Gore. I also will say one final thing. Uh, our Former President Jimmy Carter, Nobel laureate, said to me once that, that he and Rosalind wrote one book together. <laughs> right. And after that said, you know, they no told, more. They no told more. Us, they, they told yeah. us about that experience yeah. and strongly advised us not to, to try to do this together. And your experience was? It well, we, we have had a, a very a good experience. And yeah. I think I stumbled on one of the reasons why. What? Uh, we found that. Uh, in a lot of the marriage experts say there are three phases to the typical marriage, mutual infa uh, no, uh, infatuation, romantic right. infatuation, uh, power struggles, yeah. where mm -hmm. each tries to remake the other, and mutual acceptance. I'm in the fourth stage, which is abject surrender. <laughs> so we've, we've been able to I'm work the witness, it out. That's what he said. Right. He surrenders to whatever you say. Yeah. All right. Joined at the heart, I said, transformation of the American family, Alan Tibb I thank you very thank much. Thank you very Pleasure. much, Charlie. Thank, thank you. you. Great to see you. Thank you for joining us for this hour. We'll see you next time.